boom, we are recording. This is Conscious Growth, episode 32. We're going to talk about our pillars of content, ads, tracking, analytics, attribution. Austin, which one do you want to start with today? Start with the uh, Facebook ads one you were bringing up prior to the call. Oh, the tracking yeah. one. Okay, interesting. So this was on last week's uh, podcast. We talked about uh, how Meta is stealing souls and infiltrating dreams to get better data. So we were joking, but their data has seems to have gotten better. And we posted this up and we had uh, our good friend on LinkedIn, our LinkedIn friend, comment on the post. Uh, he's a I think senior engineer at AWS. I'm not sure. But he mentioned some ideas about how there might be, some of these companies might be getting better data on their ads platforms. And it was super interesting. It was just interesting because it kind of like got me to think about how we could open up the conversation to get people just putting ideas out there about how some of this tracking might be working to get better audience data. He mentioned that it's possible some of these companies are using data from other apps like an uh, uh, example he gave as a potential way a company could be doing this is Meta using WhatsApp data, like they're geotargeting data mm-hmm. for when you basically give the option to allow them to geolocate you in your WhatsApp app on your phone and being able to take some of that data and use it for audience targeting on Meta. That was super interesting. He also said it's po- possible that some of these companies use low-level programming languages to get around uh, some of the operating system locks, basically, on the ability for some of these apps to use data from your phone. And he was talking, he gave that example, talking about how TikTok might be getting extra data from people's phones. So really interesting ideas I'd never heard because in the media buyer space, we never hear some of these ideas about how some of these apps might be working. But uh, yeah, it shed some light on potential ways these companies are getting data. I know you were joking about this, Austin, but I don't know. Do you have any other ideas about how they might be doing this? How ads could magically improve? as performance get better over time, worse over time? Yeah, I think they're improving. Well, yeah, I got a bunch of different things. I think they're improving right now for a few reasons. One, I think the marketplace is less competitive. I know we've talked about this a bunch, but I do think that a lot of businesses either stopped advertising and like lost business, like went out of business or were prepping for like the beginning of the year to have some sort of recession and kind of just pulled back marketing spend overall. Yep. yep. Now, would that make consumers... Uh, convert better? No, but would that change CPM and CPC costs? For sure. And so we're seeing much better CPMs right now, just across the board. So that'd be number one. Number two is supposedly, right? These are algorithms that are supposed to spin up and get better over time. So every single year that the Facebook algorithm exists, it should get better at figuring out who buys and when they buy. So there is something to be said about machine learning and the fact that um, maybe it's continuing to get to critical mass in the sense of like, oh, we know exactly when someone's going to buy somewhere like, and it's doing a better job of that. And then, yeah, I think the other option is is kind of this one that he brought up, which is they're getting data. They figured out how to get around like Apple's restrictive policies or any of these like browser-based tracking systems. And they do own WhatsApp and they do probably own tons of subsidiary companies we have no idea about. And they do probably have backdoor partnerships with a lot of these platforms that they're serving like Meta's version of display ads on. I would assume Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if they do, they also have in that partnership, we get all your data and everything that's going on. So then like, let's say you're on like, I I don't know who they own. So I'm just using some random, I'll use the Atlantic. You're on the Atlantic and you're scrolling through and oh, whoa, look, it's all these ads that should have been on Meta, but, or should be like a display type ad. I would assume they're taking all the data that goes on that site. They're buying all of that in the back door. Whether that's public or not, it may be public. I've never looked into it, but they may publicly say that they do deliver all that data to Facebook. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, I do think they have finally figured out how to get around Apple's policies. And like the data is pretty much within 10% variance between like Triple Whale and Meta, which is Meta last day one click, which is great. That's great. Yeah. It's yeah, it's so interesting. I love that. That's a that's an interesting idea too about like the whether it's a real time bidding network or just inventory on the site that it's not not metas, maybe not Google's, but they're somehow able to buy that data or track it or their pixels able to pick it up. Uh, just the idea of incorporating other data sets we wouldn't expect is super interesting. And that's why I love that uh, we got that comment about how this might be happening. Cause I hadn't thought of that. But it, yeah, so I mean, why wouldn't you buy other data sets or get your hands on anything you could? So Maybe, maybe that is how it's happening. And who knows? They probably own so many companies. Yep. They're like Google. They're just buying every single, like they probably just buy tons of companies to do that strategy where you point traffic in the correct way. Or you're buying literally just a massive news site just so you can aggregate all that data and use it on their platform to improve their ability to serve ads. 
Yeah. Like you said, the backdoor partnership, I'm sure there's just like so many. We'll have to keep this conversation going. I hopefully we get some more comments like that. I just was like, whoa, I had never thought of this stuff before tracking. Okay. Oh, for ads platforms too. Okay. So the one we've been using a lot is Foreplay and it allows you to basically look at another company's ads, be able to save ads from Facebook, Meta Ads Library, same thing for TikTok. You can save all the ads, including landing pages and basically freeze it in time so that the landing page that that ad was running to, even if it gets taken down or the ad gets taken down, they're able to save that. So you can have all that data for, you know, all the companies you want basically saved in libraries of these ads. So it's an amazing platform. I haven't seen anything that compares to it. I feel like they're definitely going to get bought by some other company. How are you using this though, Austin? I know you've been using it on like every account. Yeah. I've been sending it to clients to like, I have uh, specific folders with like top ads saved by type of ad. And I've been sending that to clients when I want to get something made that uh, someone else has a great example of. Similarly, I've mm -hmm. been using it to send to influencers to show them what type of content they need to create for the whitelisted posts. And then of mm -hmm. course I've been like during holidays, I save all the ads that I can because those go away pretty quick. They're not going to be saved in the folder. So uh, for next year's holidays, yeah. I can come back and look at it before that happens and kind of figure out what makes, what would be the best to mimic based on performance. Yeah. Yeah. That's also one of those holiday folders. Yeah. All good stuff. Uh, the other one we had was tracking or excuse me, analytics. So I know some of the dashboarding has changed on triple well. And we brought, we brought this up before the call because, so we used to use by Jove. Mm -hmm. It was the name of the, the company that originally came out with a dashboarding solution. That was amazing. It was an amazing creative dashboard by far the best I've seen. It got purchased by a big agency taken off the market. And so I haven't seen anything as good yeah. until now. I know triple well is continually advancing their product. You said that you like their dashboard now. It's about as good. It's gotten mm -hmm. to that point. Yeah, it's getting there. Yeah, we're using it now to segment, you know, uh, the different objectives that we're running within each campaign. So if we're running to X offer, then I segment that so we can see just those ads. One thing I do want them to figure out is uh, lumping ads together that have the same image or the same copy just so yeah yep. yes. that was kind of like the, that was the best feature ever yeah that was the best with by because we could actually see what's going on which yeah hopefully someone doubles down on that uh but yeah i mean yep. triple oil is always getting better so i'm always excited to see kind of what they've going on any new improvements they make i'm also very excited to test that platform you sent the other day to see um competitor data anonymous competitor data yep yeah i know this was like the dashboard you wanted to build for like all facebook wide Facebook wide data, but uh, you need it. Yeah. There's so many times as marketers where, and I know some people always complain about this on LinkedIn with posts about agencies where they'll say, you know, the market's down right now. This is out of my control. And so I'm trying to see the name of the software so we can post it. So it's called Veros, V-A-R-O-S.com, yeah. KPI benchmarking for marketing conversions revenue. So basically what it does is it aggregates data from a ton of different companies and it pulls the average, you know, metrics you'd want on ads, so click-through rates, CPMs. I think they have, yeah, they still have conversion data on there as well, but it'll basically give you an idea of the, the market for different ads platforms. So again, V-A-R-O-S, Veros.com. I'm going to check it out next week. Super excited to yeah. see if that actually has I already signed up. matches what we're seeing on the platforms. Uh, I signed nice. up and I linked accounts. It takes like three or four days for them to actually aggregate the data and match it. So yeah, I'm eager to see how it can help us verify how good we're doing. I mean, one of our companies just, uh, yeah. I had a article sent today showing um, the crazy growth of one of the companies we're working at, which we cannot disclose that uh, they were like number two on this person's like fastest growth um, CPG brands under Olipop with like a thousand percent year over year growth. And you can literally see when we jack spend up in the graph that they had. And it was pretty funny. One of our mutual co yeah, connects yeah. sent us it. Yeah. Probably gave it away with a list with them on number two after Olipop. But... <laughs> We'll see. Uh, yeah, super exciting though. For sure, it'd be fun to see though. Yeah, how this how this stacks up against that. Hopefully, it, it mirrors what we're seeing there. Okay, we had influencers. So the big topic here is just that we saw a bunch of funded companies. One in particular that was close to twenty million in funding that was not didn't appear to be using any influencer whitelisting. So no, they're not running any ads through influencers accounts. Uh, and then it's just, it's this was in a space we were super familiar with that we have tons of influencers mm -hmm. we regularly work with. So we were just 
our jaws drop when we saw that. If you're not working with influencers, whitelisting accounts, especially if you're a funded company, you need to be, yeah. you know, whether it's an in-house marketer or an agency, either one, just get them using whitelist or uh, whitelisting ads. Uh, make sure they're working with influencers. You know, you don't necessarily have to fire them, but uh, make sure they start working with influencers. Yeah. If you're working with a, as as a paid agency and the paid agency isn't bringing up anything about influencer marketing, come on. Same thing as like, if you're a, a company doing this well or with funding and you have a founder who has some sort of following and you're not running ads as that founder. That's the craziest one. I mean, it's almost every single account we've ever taken over that has a founder that has some following. They're not even testing it. They're just like, nah, he doesn't really want to do ads. Like, I don't care. He needs to do ads because it's his business and he wants it to succeed. And he probably wants to pay less per person he onboards into it. And if he doesn't believe in the product, he doesn't believe in the product, then you probably shouldn't be selling it. But that's kind of the- Yeah, another story. And all we all. That's a whole, that's a whole big rabbit hole. But yeah, it's wild. It's wild how many founders too, but in general, you need to be doing this. It's like, I feel like it's the leverage point right now. I don't know another mm -hmm. leverage point that's as big on paid media right now. It's number one. I mean, offer testing, of course. Like number one, you gotta have an offer that these influencers can sell. But I mean, we've shown again and again, product or product company can barely, I mean, we take over an account, they're doing 0.5 ROAS, which I am not like a ROAS diehard, but they're essentially losing money up to 50% of what they spend per customer to get them in the door. And they don't know their 60 or 90 day LTV normally when we come in. Some do, but it just depends. And we do yep. nothing except for putting an influencer on the account with the same offer they were running before. And it's like a 1.5 overnight. And it's like, okay, this, this is what we need to do a lot more of in order for us to succeed. Now that we have a little bit of profit, we know what's going to happen. Let's work on this offer. Let's try to get this offer to be the highest converting offer that we can. And then of course, from there, we can onboard more influencers and make sure they're pitching the, or using the number one offer and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And again, we're not ROAS evangelists, but uh, the point is a, com a company with an account that's solidly not profitable for them in a short time frame, anywhere from like one day to 30 mm -hmm. days. But in most cases, we're talking about one day profitability. Most accounts that have a well-targeted influencer you're using will go from not being profitable mm -hmm. on any campaigns to in a 24-hour period to easily profitable on multiple campaigns just in a 24-hour yes. period, whether it's click-based attribution, whatever. So big, a large buffer for profitability yeah. just using a well-targeted influencer. Yeah, it's wild. It's like literal night and day. But it makes sense. Yeah. You're like some brand with 20,000 yeah. followers and then some dude who's got a blue check mark and like 300,000 followers and tons of historical content to back him up. It's like, you should probably buy this. Like, yeah, I'll buy it. Before they were just like stupid yeah. brand marketing stuff to me. I don't care about. And then he's like, what about this thing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it totally makes sense because it comes into your awareness as this company that's trying to sell me something or this person that's highly reputable for recommending these types of things that I might use. Yep. The whatever you want to call it, the framing, the positioning of that offer is totally different yep. when it's coming from that that person versus a, a brand someone may not have heard of. You know, it's like a referral from a friend versus somebody like yep. trying to sell you something in door to door sales. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so I'm like, I'm on the phone. I can't talk to you right now. How do we get friends to do door to door sales? That's kind of the. <laughs> you want to go sell to your friends door to door? Should we stop this and just start a door to door, <laughs> door friend or door door referral business? Yeah. D two D F D two D. It's a new marketing strategy yeah. approach. Friend friend to door. Friend to door sales. Yeah, friend to door. The other one was uh reporting. I'm using MER a lot to balance out so, uh, the uh, marketing efficiency ratio to balance out one day click attribution. I love those two because they're kind of like good left and right limits for mm -hmm. ads. If you're doing on platform one day click attribution, that's in most cases the worst conversion data you're going to be looking at in terms of profitability. It's going to look pretty bad. On the other hand, marketing efficiency ratio is always going to be a lot better for the most part. Yeah. So I like to use those as left and right limits on ads reporting. Always nice to have a solid idea of how good or bad performance could be mm -hmm. theoretically. What else What else are you using though, Austin? Because I know you have some more specific ones you use in between. Yeah. That. Um, actually, one of our clients sent me a pretty good progress from Andrew Ferris talking about attribution softwares and like what he believes. And I thought it was a, a good sum up. Like he, he doesn't use many attribution softwares. He thinks that Facebook last day click is good enough. And same with Google Analytics last day click. And um, I would say I pretty much follow that too. Uh, like I use Triple Well because Triple Well gives me like a, a really good understanding of what's going on with the business. And a lot of the companies we spend more with need that mixed marketing model. But I'm also using Google Analytics a lot, especially with GA4 now because 
you know, it's all event based. So that's been pretty good to kind of gauge what's going on. And then Facebook last day click is actually how Facebook's going to be optimizing. So like if I was just in triple whale and I was like, Hey, this ad shows that it's unprofitable, but in Facebook, it shows it's profitable. And overall the ad set looks profitable. And then overall Google analytics says it's profitable. I'm going to discard triple whales profitability and I'm going to assign it to Facebook last day click. And we use that to actually scale the account up and down. So, I mean, all this is a game. There's a ball in the air being tossed around for who claims what, but still Google Analytics plus Facebook one day click plus one external platform that allows you to see another picture is going to give you the best ability to just be certain that you can or cannot be profitable at what you're spending money on. And then you can scale or not scale. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And the third party, I think is always best for like the 60 to 90 day LTV as well as ad set and ad specific performance when and if you need that. Hopefully you don't need it too much. Exactly. Yes. All right. What else do we have? We have ads, tracking, analytics, talk about influencers. What else? I don't know. Uh, we're trying out Blot Out too. That new, like, oh, not yes. new, but alternate yeah. pixel tracking, longer cookie type system. So we'll see uh, we'll See what's going on yeah. with that. But, uh, you know, we have a client that has leads that don't convert for like 30 days, right around there. Maybe it's two weeks. But um, it kind of muddies the water and Triple Oil is not really reporting that the Facebook ads lead to conversion. Facebook, of course, isn't reporting it because it's a seven day cookie. So it'll be uh, interesting to see how this helps hurts, uh, what that looks like, but I'm super excited to get it going. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like it's kind of it. It's been a really great ecosystem to market in over these past two months. Yeah. And I feel like everybody's been heads down grinding this week. Literally everyone I've talked to, same thing. 